In this video, I want to spend some time talking about a couple of terms and concepts that are a little bit newer in journalism, but still having huge impact, especially in the world of digital journalism, and that's fake news and post-truth. So we're going to take a look at uh, both of these uh, terms and, and concepts and see how they impact us in today's world of digital journalism. So uh, what we mean by fake news, first of all, let's define fake news a little bit. What do we mean when we say fake news? So we need to draw some distinctions here, and these are important distinctions. First of all, what a lot of people would call fake news, really we're talking about false news. And false news is really just news that is wrong, that is put out there, that is just, it is intentionally uh, deceiving, it is wrong information, and people know it when they put it out there. Um, that's really false news. Uh, so a lot of people would say, oh, that's fake news, that's wrong, that's, you know, and they know it, they're trying to deceive us. No, what they're talking about is false news. The term is false news. So, yeah, again, so we have these, and they, and they disguise themselves cleverly a lot of times. They make themselves look like regular uh, news establishments, and they may even copy the formats and things of regular news establishments, um, but they're really put out there deceptively. They're put out there intentionally to deceive people and to lead them astray in terms of, you know, what information may be available. So that's false news, first and foremost. Let's, let's get that clear. That's false news. A another kind of news is mistaken news. You know, sometimes news people get it wrong, right? Not, not all journalists get it right. The most famous example here is Dewey defeats Truman, right? That's a famous headline. You've, you've probably seen this before. Uh, President Truman, after he was elected, you know, everybody expected it to be the other way around. Everybody expected Dewey to win. So, they printed these in advance, thinking, well, Truman's not going to win. You know, you could almost have the same thing in the 2016 election. Everybody kind of expected Hillary Clinton to win. It didn't go that way. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some headlines out there written like that. But And that was a mistake. Obviously, they had to, to retract that. But it wasn't done in order to intentionally deceive people. Uh, it was done, you know, in advance, and it was a mistake. And a lot of times, news organizations will have to issue corrections or, or things like that. And that's really what we refer to as mistaken news. You made a mistake, right? So false news is we're trying deliberately to uh, deceive you or to, to give you false information. Mistaken news is whoops, we messed up, and now we need to print a retraction or whatever we need to we need to you know say hey we got it wrong, sorry about that. That's mistaken news. Now, fake news really has taken on a new meaning here in the in modern times. When we think about, you know, President Trump is the person who popularized this, really. Uh, fake news is what he and a lot of other people, he's not the only one who does this, but he and a lot of other people would would claim fake news anytime they see, an, uh, you know, have an article or, or a news item come up that they disagree with. Oh, that's just fake news. That's fake news. It's not true, even if it is true and everybody, you know, it's been confirmed or whatever. It's easy to say, oh, that's a fake news outlet. You know, CNN is fake news. MSNBC is fake news. The New York Times are fake news. You know, so any article that they may not like, for example, like this one, uh, he would call this fake news and has called this fake news, right? That, uh, that you know, oh, that's fake news. Even though this has been duly vetted and corroborated and investigated by serious, serious journalists, so we know these things to be facts that they're printing, but it's easy to say fake news, right? Incidentally, not, not for nothing, but the same exact time um, that this screenshot was taken, this was the, and this is the New York Times, obviously, the same exact time on Fox News, this was the uh, headline, and, and no mention at all of the, the, uh, uh, you know, tax, things like that. So, you know, it depends on the, uh, uh, you know, that's an example of news media being selective about what they put out. But anyway, uh, this is not fake news. It's a real news, but it's easy to, so fake news are things that, that people say fake news because they don't like what's being printed about them. So they, they call it fake news. Um, so there's a difference between false news and fake news. So why do we believe it? Why do we believe it when people say fake news, when people say, you know, CNN is fake news and so forth is fake news and whatever? Why do we believe it? Well, we believe it because there is in general a declining trust in the media. And whether that's earned or not, that's a totally different d discussion. Probably it is in some cases earned uh, for, for, you know, that we've had that trust erode. Our trust in the media and our trust in, in reporters and things has just eroded over the years, and there's a declining trust. That's statistically true. Uh, fewer people trust the media than they did, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. Um, there's a declining trust in the media, so we tend to believe when these false news items come out, or we tend to believe that these other news items may be fake news. When, when somebody says fake news, we tend to believe that it's false or whatever, because there's a declining trust in the media. There's also been, over the last, you know, a uh, certain number of years, five, you know, 10 years or so, really a blurring between journalism 
and opinion reporting, right? So, uh, so you have um, there, there used to be very clear lines between what is journalism, what is reporting, what is news, and what is opinion. That's why you have in newspapers, for example, you used to have an, an op-ed section of the newspaper, an opinions and editorial section of the newspaper where it distinctly said, this is not news, but this is what we believe. These are things, these are people expressing opinions, and that's different from what appears on the front page, which is reporting the news, right? Well, we've kind of blurred that, not so much in newspapers, but especially in uh, television, for example, and now certainly in online digital media. Um, we've, we've had a real blurring between those lines. People express opinions as though they are fact and as though it is news. And, and so uh, the, the consumers then get confused about, you know, is this news or is this opinion? So uh, we, there's been a significant blurring of those lines. There's also a lack of media literacy. We just don't teach it very well. We don't teach our kids media literacy very well. We don't even really, with the onset of digital journalism, digital media, there are significant numbers of adults who lack the media literacy that's required to distinguish between, oh, I saw this on Facebook, so it must be true, right? You know, it's on the Internet, it must be true, right? Uh, and we all know that's not the case, or we do, but we don't all know it. That's the point. We don't all know it, and, and so we, we lack the media literacy uh, that's required to distinguish between false news items and real news items, and to distinguish between, you know, when somebody calls something fake news, is it really fake news, or is it not? Is it just something that they don't want us to, to look at or believe? We, we have lost that media literacy. Uh, we also had a significant shift in consumption methods. Right? It used to be, I mean, I remember as a child watching the nightly news uh, every night. You know, my dad would watch the nightly news, and we would watch the nightly news together. And that was, I mean, our primary form of, of uh, news gathering nationally and internationally was the nightly news. And then locally, we got the paper. We got the local paper. And, and so those were our methods for consuming news. That's how we got our news. Um, anymore, everybody gets the news all the time, right? On your phone, on your computer, digitally. We get. I mean, so we've had these enormous changes in consumption methods, which has led to varying ways that, that media platforms deal with that and try and try and bring viewers in and consumers in and things. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things connected to that. But we've had a, a significant shift in our consumption method, which has changed the way that we view the news and the way that the news is reported. And and so that that shift in how we consume media has changed how we uh, engage with media and, and how it's presented to us. And then repetition. I mean, you see things, when you see something for the first time, you may be like, eh, I don't know, that doesn't hit me quite right. And then you see it again somewhere else. Well, I saw it on Facebook, now I'm seeing it on Twitter. And now I'm seeing it here and there. And blah, blah, blah. You see it enough times and you start thinking, well, I guess it's true. You see something that many times, <laughs> or you hear it enough times, then it must be true, right? They beat us over the head with it, then it must be true. So repetition is another factor in why we believe these these stories and these uh, news items. So, uh, so what can we do to combat fake news? What can we do as, as digital journalists? What can we do to work against fake news and false news? Well, first of all, we can follow the ethical guidelines, right? We discussed these in our in our video on ethics, and so you can go back and review these. This, is this for example, the, from the Society of Professional Journalists, these code of ethics, we can follow ethical guidelines. We can do the best we can to be really ethical in reporting the news, and, and so that people can start to, to sort of build some of that trust again with the media. That would be significant. We can label between advocacy and commentary. We can make it clear when we're when we're presenting news and when we're presenting opinion, right? Uh, and, and so I have examples here. There's a big difference between uh, news personalities on Fox News, for example. So here we have Chris Matthews, right? Who's a, who's a you know, more traditional news person. This is a reporter. This is somebody who goes with facts and interviews and things like that. And somebody like Tucker Carlson, who's an opinion giver, right? His show is not centered on, on reporting and hardcore news. They are commenting, providing commentary on the news. There's nothing wrong with either of those things, but we need to distinguish between them so people have a clear understanding. And to be fair, uh, all outlets have this, or most media, major media outlets have this now, this combination of these things, right? CNN does, for example. During the day, they have their, their more straight, uh, you know, kind of reporting going on. They're reporting the news, and you have, like, Anderson Cooper and Wolf Blitzer. Those are more traditional journalists and reporters and things like that, or anchors. And then you have people like Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon, who are more commentators, right? They, they're not so much out there, you know, digging in the trenches and reporting the news. They're, they're, they're providing commentary, they're providing context and color and so forth. Again, nothing wrong with any of that, except that we need to be clear in separating the two, or at least 
labeling the two. Right? And we need to support media literacy, for sure. We need to make sure people understand the difference between fact and fake. And, uh, and so we need to teach people how to define that difference and how to understand that difference. Okay? So we as journalists, are there some things we can do to help uh, combat fake news? And a couple things like that. So, okay. So enough about fake news. Let's shift gears here a little bit and talk about what we mean by post-truth. This may be a new term to you. I don't know. It was the word of the year. The Oxford, Oxford Dictionary pill. Sorry, the Oxford Dictionary uh, selected this as the word of the year in 2016 because it became so prevalent then. So post-truth says uh, the dictionary definition is relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So post-truth means basically we're moving, you know, we're moving me up. Well, you know, that may not be factual, but it's true for some people, and it's what I believe to be true, and so forth. And we kind of live in a post-truth society, right? Where people are less interested in, well, you know, that's true, that's a fact or whatever. They're less interested in that than they are, but that's not what I believe. That's not, you know, that's not how I see things. So, and the truth is, I mean, this is really irritating for a lot of people because a fact is a fact for a reason. I mean, it's true or not true. A fact is either something that is re it's either factual or it's not. And there's no hedging that, really. There's no fudging that. But that's kind of where we're at right now. We're living in a world where we have this post-truth and, and at the highest possible level. So, for example, one of the most famous examples of this is uh, Inauguration Day for President Trump. And I keep picking on him, but he keeps bringing this devil up on himself. So, so Inauguration Day for President Trump... Um, is an inauguration day for any president. It's a big deal. There are lots of people there, right? big crowds and things. So uh, the next day, and, and the news media is reporting, though, that eh, there aren't that many people. It wasn't that heavily attended for an, an inauguration. And so the next day, then the press secretary basically rips into the press saying, how dare you? This was the largest crowd ever for an, for an inauguration. Biggest crowd we've ever had. More people here and so forth. And, and he just goes on and on. Sean Spicer, the press secretary, goes on and on about how many people were there and so forth. And so the National Parks Department finally, you know, there's no record of kept of this official numbers, but the National Park Service has pictures of all these things. So they release this picture and say, this, you know, they do this all the time. Here's a picture of the Washington Mall during the inauguration. Okay. This is, how, you know, this is how we kind of calculate how many people were there, or guesstimate kind of how many people were there. Uh, and, and so, well, first of all, President Trump's people said this is all fake news, this is doctored and whatever, but it's the National Park Service. So they, I mean, they do this all the time. They release this information that's a pretty reliable source. And you compare this, for example, to President Obama's initial inauguration, first inauguration, which was a huge deal, a right? huge deal in the country. And so you put these pictures side by side, and the one on the left is President Obama's inauguration at the same time, at the same time of day, and the one on the right is President Trump's. Clearly, there are more people here for President Obama's. That's a fact, right? I mean, you would think that's a fact. And and Trump's people should say, no, we got that wrong. You're right. We, we were wrong. We weren't the largest one ever. And, you know, there was a lot of people there, but we weren't the largest one ever. Instead, they go on. Kellyanne Conway comes on and said, well, what we were providing you with was alternative facts. Alternative facts. Which is, there's no such thing as alternative facts, right? It's a fact or it's not. But they're making up this you know, term, alternative facts. This is post-truth. This is exactly what we mean by post-truth. Well, it's, you know, true for us. We, you know, we felt like it was an appropriate share of information. So some questions we need to ask ourselves as digital journalists in a post-truth era are this. Are we going to be concerned with objectivity or opinion? You know, again, are we going to, are we going to provide news or are we going to provide commentary? Are we interested in the facts, objective facts, or are we interested in subjective opinion? Are we, are we going to be impartial or are we going to be more concerned with popularity? impartial in presenting the facts as they are, real-time, real facts, truths and facts, or are we more interested in popularity and hedging things and phrasing things in such a way that, that make it seem more palatable to people and make us or help us make our case more? So in other words, are we journalists or are we content producers? And to be, to be fair, I have no problem with either. There's room for both. There's room for journalists. Those are necessary functions. There's also room for content producers and people who do that kind of stuff and can play a little, you know, looser with that kind of thing. But that's, journalism is not the place for it. And we need to distinguish between the two. Okay? So, uh, if you have questions about fake news, post-truth, anything related to digital journalism, please shoot me an email. I'm always happy to he hear from you via email and uh, answer any questions you might have. And in the meantime, get out there. Get media literate and, and start distinguishing and helping other people distinguish between fake news and post-truth and what's real and go be real journalists.